Hello, and welcome to another business strategy video. Today, we'll be discussing Porter's five forces. These are the forces that determine industry profitability. Michael Porter's five forces help us determine an industry's attractiveness. And by attractiveness, we mean its profit potential for the average company. Industries vary widely in the amount of profitability that they have on average, with industries like the soft drink industry being very profitable and industries like the steel industry being very unprofitable. So what determines the profitability of an industry? Today we'll discuss Porter's five forces and how to determine an industry's attractiveness or profitability. We'll identify specific factors in each of these five forces analyze the strength of each force, and then the combined strength of these five forces will determine the overall attractiveness of the industry. So Porter's five forces are as follows. The rivalry that exists amongst existing competition, the bargaining power of suppliers, the bargaining power of buyers, the threat of new entrants into the industry, and the threat of substitute products or services from other industries. First of all, industries can be more or less competitive. Competition among the firms uh, involves companies putting pressure on each other and trying to limit each other's profit potential by attempting to steal customers' market share, and this will limit the profits of the other firms. So why are industries more or less competitive? First off, the number of competitors in the industry. You'll have higher rivalry with more competitors. Secondly, you will have higher rivalry with a flat or declining industry than a growth industry. If there's higher fixed costs relative to variable costs, that will lead to higher rivalry because companies will need to spread out those high fixed costs across a lot of units. So they will fight to keep their volumes high even if that costs their competition volume. If there are exit barriers due to significant non-deployable assets, such as in the steel industry, you have a lot of money invested in the foundry that you can't recoup. So you will uh, fight instead of just exiting the industry. Uh, there's also higher rivalry when there's fewer differences in products. So product differentiation allows you to compete on the differences of your products. If you don't have those, then you tend to get into price wars with your competitors to fight for customers. And then finally, switching costs. There's gonna be higher rivalry when switching costs are low uh, because there's no lock-in to your customers and it's easy to steal from your competitors. So you and your competitors are constantly trying to steal customers from each other. The threat of substitutes. So what substitutes are available to your customers? A substitute is a fundamentally different product that serves the same function or purpose for the end consumer. So these will come from outside of your industry. They are a different product, but they are serving the same goal. So streaming versus cable TV, a drinking fountain versus a vending machine drink, a grocery store versus a restaurant, ride sharing versus owning a car, uh, these are all examples of substitutes that solve the customer's problem uh, but are fundamentally different products. And substitutes will act as a cap on profitability because if you try to get too much money from your customer, then they will just switch to the substitute product. All right, next up is Porter's threat of new entrants. Now, students tend to get confused when we talk about barriers to entry and how that relates to the threat of entry. So most of the things discussed will be barriers to keep people out. And as the barriers go higher, the threat of someone entering goes lower. So be sure that you're keeping those straight uh, in your mind. So some factors to keep competitors out. Uh, capital requirements of the industry. So for instance, getting into the aerospace industry is not cheap. It's not like opening a coffee shop. Uh, scale requirements. So in commodity markets like steel, you have to be able to create lots and lots of product to keep your 
uh, fixed cost spread over many units. And to get that economy of scale, uh, you have to have a lot invested in that production technology to make those many units. And so both affording the equipment and then getting enough customers to sell at that volume are both uh, high barriers to entry. Uh, scope economies are similar to scale, uh, but instead of just the sheer number of units, it's when you can find products that overlap that then give you a uh, similar benefit. So retailers can sell lots of products and then get economies uh, because they are selling them all to the same store and having one more product is uh, marginally very cheap. So switching costs. If there are high switching costs, then it is harder for new entrants to come in and convince people, hey, instead of using your Windows or Mac PC, why don't you switch to Linux? Um, and if customers don't want to do that, then it's much harder for you to get into the industry. Uh, access to scarce resources. Uh, De Beers has uh, access to diamond mines. Coke has its distribution network. And so those are limited resources out there uh, that it's harder for a new entrant to come in and start selling diamonds if they don't have you know, access to the mines. Learning curve. Uh, as you do things, you get better and better at it. Uh, so for instance, uh, the reliability of a motorcycle or a car uh, from making millions of them over decades is gonna be very different than someone coming in and trying to enter that market with no prior knowledge. Uh, product complexity. Uh, so if your product that you're selling is very complicated, uh, for instance, microprocessors like Intel and AMD, uh, you can still enter that market, but it's gonna be very few people that have the expertise to be able to do that. And then finally, is there some type of entry deterring regulations? Um, so tariffs can drive up the cost to enter the in industry. Uh, regulations like for nuclear power plants are very onerous. And so being able to navigate those regulations is difficult for newcomers. And so that protects people inside the industry and makes it harder for new entrants. What can be done to neutralize the bargaining power of buyers? Differentiate your offerings so that it uniquely responds to only certain buyer's needs. Buyers have less power when your product offers something that is unique. Narrow the options of the buyer through market consolidation, exclusive alliances, or doing something to eliminate competitors from the industry. Buyers have less power when there are fewer options. Finally, create switching costs for your buyers. Buyers will have less power when there are great costs due to learning, specialized investments, loyalty problems, network effects, etc. What can be done to neutralize the bargaining power of suppliers? Narrow the sell options of the supplier through market consolidation, merger, or alliances. Develop an alternative source of supply. So this is the exact opposite, where you now have multiple suppliers to get X uh, part from, uh, so they now have to compete with each other. Ally with the supplier and encourage the supplier to make non-redeployable, transaction-specific investments to provide inputs to you as the customer as low as possible. So you can even fund some of that yourself and get a return because you're then locking that supplier in to those investments uh, that they would have to give up if they wanted to go sell to something else. And then finally, diversify your product offerings to diminish your dependence uh, of your business on any particular supplier. Now, a second area where students get tripped up in thinking about Porter's Five Forces is what industry are we talking about that something is better or worse for. This is especially problematic between buyers and sellers and suppliers and buyers. So returning to our Porter's Five Forces diagram, we'll add some industry borders to help you understand which industry is the one that we are focusing on. There's the focal industry, and we're worried about the rivals within that industry. Now, the bargaining power of suppliers is coming from a separate industry that is supplying to our industry. And substitute products are coming from outside industries. That's a totally different product. It just happens to have uh, overlap 
with solving a similar problem for the customer. Now, new entrants are outside of the industry. So if something is good, it is for people who are within the industry. Something good for people within the industry is keeping the new people out. So if it's good for the new entrants, it's bad for us. If it's bad for the new entrants, it's good for us. And then finally, uh, buyers. Now, buyers and new entrants could be from a separate industry, um, but they also could be uh, brand new companies or uh, end consumers. So they might not technically be within industry. Now let's take an example to see why this matters. So these are the varying profitabilities of three industries in a chain. We have farmers who are selling to the frozen entree makers who are selling to the food retailers. And one of the, the items that we're looking at is the relative size and concentration of the market. So farmers are mostly small relative to the market. There are lots and lots of farmers. Uh, the frozen entree market, there are a few really large firms that are controlling a large amount of the market. And then food retailers, we have a lots of little ones and then some sort of bigger ones. So, so now let's take a look at these three industries in line. So the farmers uh, are selling a commodity product to the frozen entree makers, and there are a lot of them. And so they're going to have high rivalry and they are have an undifferentiated product and they are selling to a few really big companies. So the power dynamic there is that the frozen entree makers have more power over their suppliers. Um, if you are a farmer, the entree market is your buyer and all of the principles still stay the same, but you have to remember when you move industries like that, you're shifting who's the supplier and who's the buyer. Now, similarly, as you move forward, the frozen entree makers are selling to uh, food retailers. So they are fewer and bigger uh, versus the food retailers, and they are selling a differentiated product. So where a potato is a potato, uh, customers may have a preference for a certain brand of frozen entree. And so if you stop carrying that, then you potentially lose those customers as the food retailer. So again, the factors between the two markets move, but you just need to keep straight which one you're thinking about at any one time as the focal market versus the buyer and the supplier. All right, now that we have gone through all of the things that impact sort of the strength of these various forces, uh, we can put that all back into our original uh, diagram of each of the five forces. Now, for our purposes, we will determine whether these strengths are high, medium, or low, and then combined together, does that create an attractive industry? So for industry attractiveness, low is always better, high is bad. So here's an example of the soft drink industry. So the threat of new entrants is low because there are moderate to high capital requirements. Uh, there are scale and scope economies and there is high product differentiation and there's a distribution network advantage. So all of those things make it difficult to enter into this industry. You can enter on like a small batch scale, uh, but to go large scale is very difficult. Uh, the rivalry is medium. There are a few large companies, which is going to make it less, uh, but the differentiation is all based on advertising because they're literally selling sugar water. Uh, so they have to advertise a lot to kind of convince customers that uh, it's worth what they're paying for it. Uh, supplier power is low. You have many suppliers, your ingredients, your commodities. Uh, buyer power is medium. Uh, buyers are not very price sensitive, uh, but there are low switching costs. Uh, so there's a lot of choices for them. Uh, and threat of substitutes is high because uh, there's just so many beverage alternatives. Um, you don't have to switch to another soft drink. You could switch to water or juice or a fitness drink or a beer. Thanks for watching. And as always, remember to subscribe and hit that like button or leave us a happy comment below. Until next time.